Hello there, and welcome to the CP7 Podcast. My name's Pom. And I'm Andy. And together, we are Chrono Passion 7. Hello, and welcome to episode 24. Our Watches and Wonders shows are done. We're not going to talk about those anymore. Well, not for a little while anyway. But first, we are going to do something a bit different and not start with a wristwatch check. Andy and I have both been given loan watches, mine from Atelier Wen and Andy from Le Bond, which we'll bring up a bit later. Andy, what's today's show about then? Today, we're, we're kicking back a bit because we've had a very, very busy period and we just want to catch up on the latest events. And there's no way we could do this show without talking about Tug Oya and the KIF collaboration. So we're going to get into that very, very soon. And also Christopher Ward has also been kicking up a bit of a fuss and a storm. So we'll touch on the new 12 Titanium as well. But first, let's get into the tags. How do you feel about this new collaboration and limited run? Is it the next moon swatch phenomenon? Or is it just a bit of a flash in the pan? So Tagoya have created a collaboration watch with American streetwear brand KIF headed up by Ronnie Feig, who was a big fan of the Tagoya Formula One, saying he owned the red and black version. Much like myself, I had the blue and black version. It was my first entry into the luxury watch sphere back in the early 90s, late 80s. They've re-released them with Kith branding. The tag logo has gone, which stood for Technique d'Avant-Garde. And it was the first time Tag Hoya released a watch since Tag bought the Hoya brand. So its original run was from 1986 to 1990 and was known as the Series 1, and it was plastic and stainless steel. Now, I remember mostly the plastic ones in lots of different colours. So the question we've got to ask ourselves is, has Tag and Kith just jumped on the bandwagon and doing what the Swatch Group are doing with Omega and Blancpain, or is this a whole different thing, setting up the nostalgia for those owners of the watch back in the day? Before we get into the main discussion, we'll just break down the limited run. So there is 250 pieces of the Rubber City Edition, so they're the really funky colours. There's also the Steel City Editions, where there will be 350 pieces, or were, as the release is already out, but maybe many of them have already gone. And there is the Tug Oya exclusive in blue and green with the black DLC coated steel cases and they are limited to 825 pieces yep and staying true to the originals they also do a steel version of which there'll be 1350 pieces they call this the shared model because this one will be sold by both kith and tagoya the rubber city and steel city will be kith exclusives and the green blue dlc will exclusively be sold by tagoya awesome so now we've got the basics out of the way how do we actually feel about the collection? It's impossible, right, to see these pieces and not touch on Moonswatch to some degree. If they were not a limited run, then I'd have to say there's some serious resemblance to the release there. However, this is quite different. It's a very limited run. It's with a really hip street brand. I think this is a very special and nostalgic release. I think the biggest pain... For me, would be the price point coming in at 1,500 euros in dollars. It's also $1,500. It just feels a little steep, especially on the Rubber City editions. I can understand more on the steel and the DLC coated and the Tagore exclusives, but it just feels a little steep. And I think that's probably the Kif brand bringing that demand in there. Another thing. What didn't really resonate me, and I believe you probably will have picked this up as well, Pam, is the Just Us motto at six o'clock, which is like the family kind of crest of Kif. And that doesn't really mean anything to me. So I don't know why I'd want that on, on my watch, but it's what they print on a lot of their clothing. So I think you've really got to be into the clothing brand as much as Tag Oya as well. Like, Otherwise, why not just buy an original, the like 350 euros, for example? Why would you pay 1500 for the, the new iteration? But that's my first initial impressions, but I'm interested to hear yours. So this is interesting. I've spoken to a few people about this and on various WhatsApp chats and in person. And one thing 
that has come out is the materials used nowadays are far superior to the original. I think when I got mine back in the day, it was, I think, about £275 or something similar. It was a lot for a young kid to get a watch at that price back then. So some people are justifying it that way. Perhaps Tag and Kith are trying to justify it that way. But it's still plastic and it's still quartz. It's it's not and not a superior quartz movement either. We're not talking about Jean S quartz movement in there. For that price point, you wouldn't get that anyway. That was just a little joke there. But it's not a superior movement. It's pretty basic. Keeping the mold. I like the thing is they're, they're playing with the nostalgia. Yet, as you pointed out, the Just Us, that would put me off buying it because I have no connection with Kith. It's something that was created long after I was into the things that they make. So the price point is high, I would say. But in terms of scales of economy, £275 back in 1989 could equate to £1,500 now. So which way do you go with that? That's the thing. Yeah. But that's a really fair comment, and I'm 100% with you with the, the Just Us. It, it, I don't know, I, I just feel this is for Kith fans, but of course Tag or your fans are going to jump on this as well. But then for me, why not just buy an original? Okay, maybe the case materials are slightly better. I know certain plastics go a little sticky over the years as well, but there is some mint condition original Formula 1s available, which I am sure would... Scratch that itch after seeing these releases. So for me, it's not a release what really... It resonates with me. It's got that pop art nostalgia. The pop art comes from the colour ways for me. And it takes me back to a year, you know, an early time in my childhood when I... My next door neighbour, I mentioned this in a previous episode. He, he was a young kid, a little bit spoiled, if I have to be honest. And he had a tag at Formula One. And his dad was big on golf and that tag link back then with golf was quite large. You know, it was quite a big deal. And they were a major player in across many sports, right? And I grew up with a really good impression of Tag Oyo, thinking they were one of the best watches you could get. Just due to the marketing and the advertising, it, it does work, especially on such a young mind. But this new release, apart from giving me a flash of nostalgia... It doesn't really have me run into the website and placing an order on any of these pieces. But for fun, forget price, which would you go for, Pam? Would you go for the original, which you had in the past, or would you mix it up with a different colorway? I would go for the, the original release, not Kith. I wouldn't go for Kith. And I think maybe if I hadn't got into watches the way I have now, I may have thought, right, okay, I remember those. I had that, and I possibly would have got it through nostalgia, being an owner. But the quality wasn't that great. The actual lug snapped on mine, hence I don't have it anymore. <laughs> Therefore, I couldn't be bothered. At that time, I was just, oh, it's broken, it's broken. It's Don't worry about it. I've just got, I got something else. But I just think these will sell out very quickly and there'll be people who will be caught up in that hype. I don't think it's like a moon swatch at all. I think it's something very different. They cleverly branded it with three times Formula One winner Max Verstappen, who races for Red Bull Racing in Formula One doing the promos with all the colours. It's hitting an audience, but it's not hitting an audience that is as entry level as I think the original used to. I think it's hitting a more upmarket target audience. So in terms of would I buy this? No, because of the Kith branding on there. It's not the watch I had. I don't think that they even do the one I used to have, the blue one. It's very different. So I've also heard they use superior materials like there was quite it wasn't bad plastic but it wasn't the greatest plastic and now the the straps are made of rubber and then you also get the stainless steel ones for the same price and i just think the product is superior but for me the call to my nostalgia isn't big enough for me to say i want this would i get an old one no because i think i've just made my peace with it anyway it's nice to have had it it's just nice to tell people i used to have it that's as far as it goes, I think, with this. Yeah, excellent. I think that's a good way to summarise. As an original owner, you've already experienced that within your journey and it belongs in that place on your collecting journey and no more. For me, it was never in my collecting journey. There is a slight link with this release being around my birth year and it's kind of cool that they use a mould from the time I was born. But I'll be honest, it's not a big deal to me. 
I don't connect with the brand. I feel it's a bit more of a sneaker collectors, streetwear collectors, hype be supreme kind of people who be core yeah. customers for these. I think watch enthusiasts will have been excited when they first saw the pictures and then kind of ooh, cooled off and came to the senses and thought, just buy the OG if you really want one. They look identical. And you buy them for the price, what really... I think it's a fair price for what they are. Going back to the colours, the colours was very 80s. It was a very colourful decade. And I think to get it or to really want it and understand it, you'd have to have either been brought up in the 80s or appreciate the 80s and its fashion and its style and its music. And it was it was just there was an explosion of colour during that decade <laughs> yeah and then these watches epitomize that explosion of color you, you need the was it kappa back then you know the shell suits the track suits or feeler if I remember. oh yeah, yeah. kappa <laughs> feeler sergio tacchini yeah. <laughs> there was tennis brands galore lacoste yeah it was it was a really cool time it was the sneaker culture came from that era yeah, so it was not kitsch and it's not tacky there are remnants from that and it, yeah. they're very cool even sneakers are encapsulate lots of different colors nowadays the more colorful they are the bigger the collab is right yeah. with the whoever they collaborated with yeah no i agree I, and I'm, I'm with you for me i would not delve into this release it, it's not for me so i wouldn't really pick a color um i'd probably go for the most bizarre colorful one to have fun but i just wouldn't commit to it the only final statement i'll say on this before we move on is could this be a start of a moon swatch so this release is nothing to do with moon swatch right but what if tag go hang on a minute we've had so much publicity from this release so much excitement do we release a standard tag oil line of formula ones once again then would that be the uber premium moon swatch competition that's one to be debated i guess but i think the price point's a little too much all the time you was mentioning about the upgraded materials to justify the price i was just thinking prx it's just like how can you it's just so much value in a prx for the same price even to the automatic like why what why you know with the palmatics why would you do it unless you was really nostalgic about the formula one it's not the best choice i don't think as in terms of quality and craftsmanship and what you're getting for value for money yeah no i think this is completely driven by nostalgia or flex that's what i think the two selling points here are Tap into people's nostalgia or tap into, like the Moonswatch did, it was wowing people. You were wowing people with a £20,000 watch on, with a £250 watch. And I think that's what this is doing. But this is at a higher price point. And it did generate a lot of conversation when the Moonswatch came out about the Formula One. Should they bring it back? And I think a lot of people assumed it would be a lot cheaper or closer to the Moonswatch price or the original price. And one thing for me, I think it's a, it's a bit of an opportunity missed in that it's not giving the average tag hoyer buyer that experience it's giving the people who can get them the experience i believe the only ones on the website i mean i don't even know how many are left there's probably very few left these are probably going very quickly let's face it they are hyped now via kith and the 1980s nostalgia with tag i just think it's an opportunity missed they could bring out more Maybe they bring out a whole range at a lower price point for everyone. Maybe they'll hit that demographic and keep everyone happy who really wants one. But at the moment, I don't think they're keeping everyone happy. But then again, I don't want to fall into the trap of being lazy and jumping on the bandwagon and putting it down because of the price and the this and the that and be foolish enough to not see the wood from the trees and that there was a demand for this. The high-end purchaser does want to buy these but they are i think they're missing the opportunity of a younger generation getting into this brand which the moon's watch is just smashing there are younger people who are getting into watches because of it and i think the opportunity is there still if as you say they put out a lower priced version i mean i don't know how they can knock off 75 percent of the price and then justify that price afterwards but they've got their work cut out to do that i'd say that but it's a great idea yeah you nailed it there i think so there's not much more to add the only way i could see the price being reduced is by the kip name being removed it drops the street value of a watch makes it less exclusive 
then maybe they can target that younger audience. I think you, you nailed it. So we'll move on then to Christopher Ward, another brand kicking up a bit of a fuss for many good reasons. And maybe some people are a little bit upset. So we're talking about the new 12 in titanium, fully skeletonized. First impressions, just looking at the piece, it looks pretty, I don't want to swear, it looks pretty good. And it's really impressive <laughs> with what they have achieved. Maybe let's just break it down a little bit, some of the features about the watch, and then we'll get into our true feelings around this launch. The unique selling point, apart from the skeletonization and the materials they've used, the grade two and grade five titanium, is the fact that it's the first 12 to be powered by their in-house Calibre SH-21 movement. This is actually the 12X TI. So X, as we know in Roman numerals, stands for 10. So this celebrates 10 years off the SH-21 movement. It is its 10th year in existence. And the watch also celebrates 20 years of the brand Christopher Ward being in operation and producing watches. So this watch is quite a special one for the brand. The Bel Canto started it all, I guess, with the chiming hour watch, the Sonnerie au Passage. And I think they took it to another level by not another level of horology, but another level of visibility with the 12. And I think, Andy, actually, I want to hear your take, because we've never talked about this as a brand on the show before, or this range of watches. What is your view on the 12 first? I think we should discuss that first and then move into how this has progressed to the skeletonized in-house movement version. So the 12 of, as the general family, it gives me mixed feelings. And the reason I get mixed feelings is due to my appreciation of a well-known brand called Chapek and uh, the Antarctique. And it's impossible not to reference these designs, cross-reference and see similar traits throughout the design ID. And I also know one of the designers from Chapek did move across around a very similar time to the launch of the 12. And I'm not saying it's a copy or it, it's a ripoff. It's not, but it'd be unfair for me not to say it is inspired by the Chapek Antarctic. It's undeniable in my view. Now, does that make it a bad watch? Does it make it a bad release? No, because it's Christopher Ward saying, you know what? We can make a watch what looks absolutely fantastic, finished superbly with a great in-house movement, and we can do it for far less than what other watch brands are doing in the integrated sports market, right? It's not just an attack art. Chapek, it's an attack art. The industry in general, they're like, hang on, the Swiss watch industry is getting a bit greedy here. We want to show for a more affordable price point. We can bring something what gives you that same satisfaction at a lower entry price point. So have they achieved that? Now that's the question. For, for me, wearing a Christopher Ward will never feel like wearing a Royal Oak. Now, are Royal Oaks overpriced? Yes. But the finishing on a Royal Oak is ridiculously good and the polishing on the bracelet, and it's just not there on the Christopher Ward. Why? Because of the price point. So there's certain things they can do which are similar to these bigger hyped up brands, but there is a reason why there is quite a high price point to them is what I'm trying to say. I'm not justifying how far these prices are starting to become with certain integrated sports models. However, there is a gap for a reason is what I'm getting at. So for me, back to the original question, I respect for 12, but would it scratch my itch if I wanted a Chapek Antarctic or a Royal Oak, it, it wouldn't because it's just not that. Would it scratch an itch for one in a more comfortable integrated sports watch? Comfortable as in I'm not wearing so much money on my wrist and I feel comfortable wearing it around? Then yes, maybe so. That's my impressions of a 12. I hope I've given a good outlook on it there. But Pam, I'm interested to hear yours. Is it similar to mine or a little bit different? I'm going to go back to the thing I said about the tag, the the easy bandwagon opinion, or am I missing, not seeing the wood from the trees? And I think when this first came out, I thought it was a good idea because Tissot, I think, started the affordable Deal Sports integrated bracelet watches. And a lot of brands, many brands, and that's an understatement, have followed suit. And Christopher Ward, rightfully so, have done so as well. 
and they've done it very well. They even mention, they even reference Audemars Piguet and Patek Philippe on the release and in the detailing on their website around this watch. So I guess they're not hiding from the fact that it's inspired by that. And Mike France is a great guy. He's a visionary. He's doing a lot of amazing things. And I know, Andy, you have a lot of respect for Mike France as well. We've talked about him many times and the great things he's doing. So I think it was a good move for them to make that. They use a Salita SW301 movement in the regular ones. This is the first one with an in-house DSH-21. The movement has been used in their watches previously, but this is the first time the 12. And, and where I'm going with this is I think this is a range where Christopher Ward can actually have some fun. And I think they could put phonographs in there. They could put calendars, annual, perpetual. Because on their dive watches, some are forces inspired, police inspired. But I think this one is the opportunity to get a bit more mainstream. My first reflection was, I don't think this is the watch that's going to get people charging towards the brand. It's going to keep enthusiasts happy and maybe pick up a few along the way. But this isn't their famous for five minutes watch. I think this is another brick in the wall, which they are building to get to that level where they'll be taken a lot more seriously. Not that they're not taken seriously, they're taken very seriously, but to get to that next level. And that's where I think the 12 range fits. And I think this 12X in titanium is the right direction to go. What do you think about that? Yeah, I agree. So for me, I, I want to make clear that I wasn't attacking Christopher Ward. I was just giving my initial impressions of when I first came across the 12, the identities, the IDs, what I saw in the DNA of the design. Now uh, it's been around a while. I've had time to make peace with that and kind of see it as its own individual watch or piece. And talking about Christopher Ward a little bit more, I do believe they had a bit of an identity crisis. Like many of their ranges were just far too vast, too many collections. There was no, that's a Christopher Ward when you see the piece on somebody's wrist. And I think now, as soon as you see the 12, whichever reference or model it may be, iteration, you're like, yeah, that's a Christopher Ward 12. And that's not easy to do in the watch industry to have a watch what's instantly recognizable when there's so many brands out there especially of the christopher world scale and size and i think for doing things right I, I agree with you i think the 12 is a piece now they can play with they can do so many cool things with the movement like we've just seen on the titanium which we'll, we'll get into and with the bel canto as well again an iconic piece I will take my hat off to the Bel Canto. It's iconic. I think it looks great. And also with their not so long ago release Moon Phase as well. So I think they're starting to get a true brand identity with these new collections. And Mike Franz knows what he's doing. He's, yeah. he's making some smart moves. So I agree with that. To be honest with you, the Bel Canto, that is a watch when you look at it. The 12, you can you may have to take a Double take to see if there's a Christopher Ward, because there are many, but the Bel Canto is the one watch that they make that instantly, oh, is that a Bel Canto? I mean, that means your model has made it. It's been referenced by the model, not the brand. It's a good move, and it's exactly the, the shot in the arm the brand needs. If they want to go, it, I can see the direction they're going in, and it's the right thing to do for the direction that they want to go in, to get more mainstream, more marketable, more popular. And at the end of the day, they're a business and they love making watches. I mean, what, what highlights that is Mike France says he will not make the price of a watch anything over three times the production cost. And again, that's a good ethic as a manufacturer and a producer of quality timepieces. That may change. You never know, because as the brand grows and it looks like they're going to keep growing and growing, and rightfully so, I think, with the creativity they are showing. I mean, even like in this watch, the SH21 movement, the in-house caliber, it's double barreled and it's got 120 hours of charge. I mean, that's a lot of watch. And again, the price, £4,120 is high for a Christopher Ward, but we're not going to talk about it. We're talking about a watch with a lot going for it as well. We're not talking about how they used to make watches. This is a higher end watch than they've possibly made before. The concepts have been great, but I think this is using the titanium the machine polished chamfers. There's a lot going into this. And should they charge 
a price like that. If they have to, they have to. I wouldn't ever say, no, Mike France, this is not what you should be charging. You should be charging this because I don't make it. Let's just break it down a little bit. In euros, the, the cost comes to 5,220 euros. So it's a fully titanium watch. Titanium grade five is extremely difficult to machine and work with to polish. And when you look at the detailing of a 12X Ti, the, all of the contours, all of the detailing and polishing, that's very, very difficult. Like many brands now within the industry, class grade five titanium, the same as working with precious metal, just due to the cost of machining the actual titanium. So bear that in mind. Then when you break down the movement, you know, as Pam's mentioned, the SH21, it's fully in-house. It's built up between two different types of titanium grade two and five. There's 100 raw components, but then on top of that, there's 98 components which have been fully crafted from scratch, fully made, machined in-house down to, you know, the train bridge, automatic bridge, our bridge, and balance bridge. Like, there's so much detailing going on there. And that costs a lot of money to, to do that. And I think just to round up on this price, try find another skeletonized titanium watch, what's done to this level by any other brand and it's going to be far more expensive find another brand what's doing an integrated sports watch fully skeletonized crafted from grade 5 titanium with in-house movement for less i think it's honestly a fair price and it's just christopher ward stepping into a different realm right a different uh marketplace but for bringing so much value for the price point i believe you've got to be into skeleton watches not everybody likes skeleton watch that's just preference but as far as skeletons go i think it i think it looks superb would i purchase it i don't think it's a watch that i'm personally looking for right now but do i respect it do i admire it i i do i think it's a i think it's a good release and i'm excited to see where they go with the next iterations of the 12. yeah well put and for our listeners in the united states this would set you back $4,335, which, as they say on their website, offers a lot of bang for the buck. And I'd have to agree with that. It's a lot going on there. Would I get a 12? I possibly wouldn't because I'm not in the market for that type of watch. Would I get this one? Skeletonized and in my current stage of my journey is not something I'm particularly looking for in any brand or watch. I would get a Bel Canto. I have been admiring them from afar and hopefully they keep them in production for a, a while longer. And I, I may get one because it's such a great watch. As is this 12X. Check it out in the show notes. Of course, look at our Instagram for our show notes where you will see every watch we have discussed today. So, Andy, we'll move on from Christopher Ward into that wristwatch check. What have you got on your wrist there? So today I am rocking the Le Bond Sorta Mora, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's a Portuguese name. As Le Bond, let me just break down the brand a little bit. So Le Bond are based in Barcelona, and they work with Pitzer Prize winning architects from around the world. The two pieces which were on loan to me was the Caesar and the Sorta Mora. The Caesar, designed by Alvaro Caesar who is an incredible Portuguese architect, famous for designing the Leica pool in Portugal, an absolute stunning natural swimming pool. It makes me want to go there, actually, when I've seen the pictures and imagery of the pool. And then the Sotomora is designed by Eduardo Soto de Mora, who is also Portuguese and famous for his minimalism and his use of creating very angular and linear designs, so very clean concepts. And you see both designers elements of their architecture within the designs of of the pieces so it's really been fun trying both the caesar and the sotomora which was my favorite the caesar i'll put the pictures it's just an incredible piece it's this funky diamond shape it's actually 49.5 millimeters so it's quite large but due to it being a diamond shape it doesn't really dominate your wrist. I'm a 6.9 inch wrist circumference. It doesn't dominate my wrist. It felt great. It took me a little while to gel with it. And then one night me and Pam was actually speaking and I, I showed you right on the, you know, on the cam and you were like, yeah, that's really cool. 
Yeah, at first I, I was like, I, what is that? Yeah, and I felt the same. I, I kind of, I gravitated towards the sort of more because it's more conventional. What makes it unconventional is that the dial, crown, and caliber is all turned to 30 degree clockwise. So it's like a driver's watch. So it's kind of confusing at first. Maybe you've got to get used to moving the wrist a little bit to the 30 degree angle to make it all align. But it's a really fun way of telling the time and a new creative way with Le Bon. I really enjoyed it. However, the Caesar was just, gosh, we, we spoke about it and you were like, just wear a nice formal shirt with that and it will really come alive. And I wore like a crisp black shirt, cream pants. And my word, I was like, it just clicked. I was like, this is incredible. And it just popped. All of the color tones just popped. And I really, really enjoyed wearing the Caesar. I didn't want to take it off my wrist in all honesty. Uh, both great pieces, both made out of grade five titanium, extremely lightweight. There's this, to talk about Le Bond on how they feel, they have a very unique feel, which is Le Bond. That's the only way I can describe it, down to the clasp design, fully titanium as well. Uh, the clips are actually um, stainless steel as well. Like it's, it's a mix of components, but overall great, uh, grade five titanium in keeping with the case. But they just have this certain architectural, industrial feel to them. Contemporary, minimalist, clean and pure, which you don't get from other brands. And I think that's the best way to describe Le Bond is purity. There's a pure feeling to them. And you do feel like there's a connection with a different world outside of the watch industry due to the design, due to them being designed by architects, and not watch designers. It you just feel a different connection. And if you've never tried Le Bond, if you've never heard of a brand, just go check them out, give them a try when possible. Uh, I highly recommend them. I'm really, really impressed and really enjoyed the test drive. But Pam, what are you rocking on your wrist today? I just want to go back to that watch. Really cool. Really impressed. I wasn't, like I said, at first, I didn't understand why the Caesar looked the way it did, but I saw it on your wrist for the first time in real time. And it was like, wow. That actually looks awesome. Again, just goes to show a watch not on a wrist is not always the best way to judge it or understand it. You're 100% right. Try on the watch. Throw dimensions out of a window. Uh, throw K-shape out of a window. You might not think you're going to like it, but if you can try on any kind of funky different watch or any size, just try it if you have the opportunity to do so and you might be surprised. We will drop a link to Le Bon's website so you can see the full collection there. And just to touch, price point for all the collections is €2,700 and you can have them in original and dark and black editions. So a blacked out edition of a Caesar is available. And then in the Sota Mora, there is a dark edition, which is one which I'm rocking today. Uh, but they have an original with a cream dial. The dark edition has more of a grey kind of stealthy look to it, let's say. So do check them out. Palm, I'm interested. Which Atelier Wen are you wearing today? I am wearing an Atelier Wen. I've been corrected that I was saying Atelier Wen last week in episode 23, our Watches and Wonders Part 2. Check out that episode where we extensively covered our experience with Atelier Wen. Yes, so today I am wearing the watch I have been given on loan by Atelier Wen, the watch that I first saw over a year ago, the Atelier Wen Perception Piao, which is the sky blue dial with this incredible guilloche on it. I don't want to say Tiffany blue because I think that that's a bit lazy. So it's a nice sky blue. And I think because the design of the watch is around Chinese architecture. I want to give it a nice spiritual theme to it. And the, the dial is, it does remind you of a sky, a bright summer sky without a cloud in it. The way the light shimmers off this dial is incredible. Check out the Instagram. We have put reels on there, which you can see it is the sky blue one. Getting into the watch, I don't want to cover it too much because Andy will be getting this in a week or so as well. So we can both give a combined review. I'll make some notes and we can talk about it together on a show. So the selling point I'd say so far for this watch is this amazing Gioche dial created by Chinese Gioche master Cheng Yu Tsai. I said Cheng Yu Kai last time. I was corrected by Chloe, a new listener to the show, who I met at an Atelier Wen event in London just last week. 
where they invited me over and got to see the watches again, and they lent me this lone watch. So shout out to Ignatius from Atelier Wen. It was great to see him and again. They put on a great spread for everyone who attended. I got the lone watch, and I got to see some incredible pieces again as well. And shout out to Chloe, who is kindly correcting my Chinese pronunciation and is great to have someone with her knowledge of watches listening to the show. So that's what I have got on my wrist. Excellent. So I'm, I'm not going to say any comments on that. I'm just going to look forward to the individual experience and I look forward to that upcoming show. So I think that is all we have time for on today's show. But as always, please check out the show notes. By now, I really hope you know our Instagram. It's chrono underscore passion underscore seven. Please go on there. All the updated show notes will be there with all of the watches and pieces we have discussed today. Links to Atelier Wen, I am guessing we will also put in the show notes and also Libonda, of course. So please check out both brands, uh, both doing great things. And is there anything else? Just thank you, everybody, for your continued support. Thank you for being such a great community. Please reach out to us. Just send a message to the CP7 inbox on, on IG and we'll always engage with you. We're always interested to know your opinions on the pieces we've discussed today as well or if, on any of the topics what you'd like us to get involved in. So that is Asta Luego from me. It's goodbye or adios. So as Andy says, adios from Barcelona. I just want to reiterate, if you want to comment on this show or any other shows, please do it on our Instagram under the show notes post that we put out. It's always great to hear feedback from everyone. We're getting some feedback now, which is good, getting more than we did before. And it's always welcome. And we'll always aim to continue what we're doing right and try to improve what you may think we need to add to the show. So on that note, from London, it's Toodle Pip and Laters, and we'll see you and you'll hear us in the next one. 